Hello, this is Dr. Marissa Markey from McKee Palmel Equine Services, and today I'm going to be speaking about infectious disease control in the horse population. Infectious disease control is composed of two components, reducing exposure by biosecurity, isolation of new and sick horses, and general hygiene to prevent an outbreak and contain one if it happens, and then increasing resistance. We do this by vaccination and improving the health status of individual animals. Today we will be speaking about vaccination. The first question is how do vaccines work? I like to think of the immune system as an army and all of my metaphors help me figure that out. So vaccines work by providing a mugshot. Provide a mugshot to the immune system so they know who the bad guys are. Vaccines are not a protective bubble that will stop a horse from becoming infected. Instead, they're a tool to teach the horse's own immune system what the bad guy looks like and how to fight it. When we use vaccines in a herd situation, they can increase resistance and reduce the number of horses that are infected and decrease the severity of disease in individual horses. One important concept in vaccination is the primary series. So a primary series of the vaccine program is important to increase the number of cells that recognize the pathogen. When we first administer a vaccine, if you think about that mugshot, only a few of your soldiers get to see that mugshot. And they will increase in numbers to a degree and recognize that pathogen. When we go back three to four weeks later and re-administer a vaccine and essentially show the body that mugshot again, they realize this is a very serious pathogen that they definitely need everybody to know about. And that's when the cell numbers who recognize that virus or bacteria increase to a protective level. So that first primary series, we do three to four weeks apart and then annually to remind the body, this is what the bad guy looks like and he's still a bad guy we need to watch out for. Without this primary series, the horse's immune system will not develop appropriate immunity. Only a few cells will know what that bad guy looks like. This pr primarily applies to foals and young horses receiving their first vaccines and adult horses with unknown vaccine histories. The exception being the rabies vaccine. It does not require a booster dose three to four weeks later and can be boosted annually. When we talk about vaccines, it is also important to recognize that sometimes we can have adverse reactions. Essentially, vaccines are stimulating the horse's immune system. And so when we have overstimulation of that system for some reason, we see adverse reactions. They don't occur often, but they can be important when they do. The general mild systemic effects that we see can be mild depression, lethargy, or a low-grade fever. We can also have mild local reactions, such as swelling at the site of vaccine, sore muscles, and more seriously, abscess formation. And then we start looking at the serious uh, adverse reactions, such as hypersensitivity reactions. Anaphylactic response can occur within seconds to minutes and will result in the horse collapsing. Uh, respiratory distress, inflammation of the GI tract, enterocolitis, or diarrhea can occur within one to two hours and will need treatment. Horses can also have develop hives, which can occur within several hours. Anytime any of these adverse reactions happen, even the mild ones, please let your veterinarian know. We like to note this on the horse's file, and in the case of the more severe reactions, we'll need to come back and treat the horse. Smart vaccination is using products that are safe and effective and using products that are against the pathogens that the horse is likely to encounter at the time when they are approaching high risk. For example, high risk situation would be mosquito season, show season, traveling, foaling, or other potential exposure to pathogens. We do not want to vaccinate horses that are stressed, about to be stressed, or are already systemically diseased. We don't want to be disturbing their immune system when they are already working on fighting something. It's important that every owner is aware of diverse reactions so they know what to look for. We advise that someone be present to observe the horses for a few hours after the vaccination to watch for those delayed reactions. At McKee Palnell, our vaccination recommendations are based on products that are proven safe and effective. We have core vaccines that are recommended for all horses, and then we have risk-based vaccines for horses in at-risk situations. We do recommend splitting the vaccines over multiple visits so that we do not overwhelm the horse's immune system, and therefore we minimize the risk of reactions. The core vaccines that are recommended for all horses include tetanus, which can be contracted from the soil, 
rabies that can come from wildlife, West Nile virus from mosquitoes, and the eastern and western equine encephalitis, also from mosquitoes. As you can see, no horse is safe from these risks as they are all exposed to soil, wildlife, and mosquitoes. If we talk about our core vaccines in more detail, we'll start with tetanus. Tetanus occurs when Clostridium tetani, a bacteria found throughout the soil, gains access to the body through a wound. As it multiplies in the tissues, it produces a neurotoxin. Horses are considered exquisitively sensitive to tetanus. They commonly pass Clostridium tetani in their feces, so there is high environmental contamination. They also seem to be much more sensitive to the toxin than other animals, therefore creating a perfect spiral. Toxins cause severe muscle spasms, rigidity, and death. The pictures on the right are the classic tetanus horse, her head held high with the ears pricked up, paralysis of the muscles, muscle fasciculations, and eventually paralysis of breathing muscles. Vaccination protects against the disease. It's considered a very safe vaccine, and annual vaccination is recommended after the primary series. Vaccine does require primary series and annual boosters. Broodmares should be boosted three to four weeks before foaling so that those antibodies are also passed to the foal in the first milk. Foals should receive a three-dose series with the start time dependent on the mare vaccination status. On a side note, horse people should all be up to date on our tetanus vaccines as well. We are also in that environment and at risk of cutting ourselves and allowing bacterial penetration. Uh, in humans, a booster is recommended every 10 years, generally in high school, so around 15, 25, 35, 45, and so on. The next on our list of core vaccine is rabies. Rabies is classified as a zoonotic disease, which means it can be spread from animals to humans. It is 100% fatal. It's a virus frequently found in wildlife in southern Ontario, and it is spread by infected saliva in bite wounds. Horses are exposed through unnoticed bites on the nose and legs. Outdoor turnout is not necessarily required, as rabid wildlife does not have normal behavior and it can wander into stables and bite horses. Clinical signs in the horse are really variable. So we can see behavioral changes, including aggression, incoordination, muscle weakness or paralysis, hypersensitivity to stimulation, difficulty swallowing, fever, colic, lameness, recumbency, meaning they're down and can't get up. The disease usually progresses to death within four to five days, although some horses can survive up to 15. As you can imagine, this is a large risk to humans as they can become aggressive towards their handlers and each other. And a lot of these signs, such as difficulty swallowing, colic, will bring us to handle their mouth where they are shedding the virus. Rabies is a serious threat in Ontario. If an animal is suspected of being rabid or a person thinks that their animal has been exposed to rabies, it is required by law to report it to the CFIA or Canadian Food Inspection Agency. If the animal has potential exposure and has not been vaccinated itself, it may be ordered to be euthanized by the federal veterinarian. Below is a chart recording the 2017 rabies testing. 119 animals were tested positive in Ontario last year for rabies virus. The rabies vaccine is considered safe. Vaccination of adult horses requires a single dose and then annual boosters. We should provide a booster to broodmares four to six weeks before foaling or before breeding. And the full vaccination depends on the mare's status again. Moving on to our mosquito-borne pathogens, starting with West Nile virus. West Nile is carried by birds and spread through mosquito bites. Cases are most likely to occur in late summer, early fall, based on this life cycle of the virus. There is a persistent wildlife reservoir of this virus in southern Ontario, and we continue to see cases in horses. In 2017, there were 21 cases documented. It is important to note many insurance companies require documentation of West Nile virus vaccination. The clinical signs of West Nile virus exposure and infection include ataxia, which looks like incoordination or inability to place their limbs where they want, weakness of the limbs, muscle twitching or fasciculation, teeth grinding, fever, and recumbency. Unfortunately, this virus can be deadly to horses. Mortality is estimated around 30 to 40 percent. Um, some horses can recover, but it often requires quite lengthy and expensive hospitalization and care. 
The vaccination for West Nile virus requires a primary series again and then annual boosters. The duration of immunity is unknown. Therefore, late spring vaccination is recommended right before mosquito season starts. Foals require a primary series of three doses. Again, the timing is based on the mare's vaccination status. The other side of West Nile virus management is management to reduce exposure, keeping the horses inside during peak mosquito hours, eliminating standing water where mosquitoes can replicate, and using fly sheets and fly spray will also help reduce the risk to your horse. Next on the list of mosquito-borne pathogens are eastern and western equine encephalitis, often known as triple E and WE. These are viruses that are also spread by biting insects and cause signs very similar to West Nile virus. In 2017, there were two reported cases of eastern encephalitis. These encephalitis have zoonotic potential. Humans can become infected by mosquitoes carrying the virus. Horses cannot transmit the virus directly to humans, however. Clinical signs include high fever, dull attitude, depression, lack of appetite, walking aimlessly, often in circles, pressing their head into corners, blindness, ataxia, recumbency, seizures, and death. More than 80% of cases do die from this disease. Therefore, we recommend vaccination. Vaccination, again, involves a primary series and annual boosters. The vaccine is safe, effective, and generally free of side effects. Immunity is not long-lasting, so horses should be vaccinated in late spring and might require boosters for traveling over the winter. Foals are vaccinated with a three-dose primary series. Broodmares should receive boosters before foaling. Our encephalitis vaccine is combined with tetanus, so that single shot provides vaccination against eastern encephalitis, western encephalitis, as well as tetanus. This brings us to our risk-based vaccines. Risk-based vaccines are tailored to each individual horse and their particular situation. Influenza and rhinopneumonitis, which is a herpes virus, these are respiratory diseases that are contracted from other horses. Potomac horse fever is something that can be contracted from the environment, strangles contracted from other horses, and then botulism contracted from the environment and feed. First, we'll discuss influenza and rhinopneumonitis. Both are highly contagious viral respiratory diseases that are spread from horse to horse through nasal secretions. Shortened to flu rhino, it is recommended for horses who show, travel, or live at a farm where other horses come and go from the property frequently. Influenza and rhino respiratory disease generally happen as an outbreak within a population. Clinical signs include fever, coughing, nasal discharge, and swollen lymph nodes. Rhinopneumonitis is a herpes virus, and it doesn't always do just the one thing we expect, such as respiratory disease. There are some other things it can contribute to as well. Herpes virus can also cause abortion, encephalomyelitis, so neurologic disease, and septicemia or infection in foals. Vaccination against influenza rhinopneumonitis requires a primary series and then is recommended a minimum of every six months in order to prevent significant respiratory disease and to reduce the shedding of infectious virus to other horses. It is important to know if you are showing based on FEI regulations, horses are required to have a booster every 180 days, but not within 21 days of a horse show. Foals should receive this vaccine in a three-dose series, and again, the timing is dependent on the mare's vaccine status. The vaccine that we use at McKee Pownall is the Calvenza vaccine. It includes equine influenza, equine herpes virus 1, and equine herpes virus 4, and can be administered in the muscle or in the nose. Another risk-based vaccine to discuss at this point is often termed the anti-abortion vaccine. It is for pregnant mares to decrease the risk of herpes virus abortion. It is important to note there's no protection from other causes of abortion. It is a vaccine against equine herpes virus one, and some of these vaccines also include her equine herpes virus four. It should be administered at three, five, seven, and nine months of pregnancy. Another vaccine to discuss at this point is our, the multi-vaccine. 
So this is considered a five-way plus West Nile virus. So that is influenza, rhinopneumonitis, eastern encephalitis, western encephalitis, tetanus, and West Nile virus. These multivalent vaccines tend to have a higher incidence of adverse reactions, as you can imagine with this many different pathogens within one vaccine, you're going to really stimulate the immune system. We do carry this multivaccine, but we try to only use it in cases when the horse would not otherwise receive vaccination, and we only use it in horses that have not previously reacted poorly to a vaccine. Moving on to our other risk-based vaccines. Let's discuss strangles. Well, strangles is a highly contagious bacterial infection of the upper respiratory tract caused by Streptococcus equi, subspecies equi. The most reliable vaccine is made from a modified version of the live bacteria that is sprayed into the nostril. This provides local immune response in the way that the horse would naturally become infected. This vaccine does carry some risk of reaction, particularly in horses that have been exposed to strangles in the past as their body has already seen that mugshot for real. If previous exposure is suspected, Antibody levels can be measured in the blood to determine if the horse is a candidate for vaccination. They may already have developed enough natural immunity that they do not require the vaccine. We need to be careful how and when we administer this vaccine as accidental intramuscular administration can cause abscess formation. Strangles itself causes purulent nasal discharge, lymph node abscesses, fever, depression, and going off their feed it generally appears as an on-farm outbreak. The Strangles vaccine is recommended as a primary series at two to three week intervals, followed by annual boosters. It is labeled for horses nine months of age or older. This vaccine is an intranasal vaccine and it can sometimes be dangerous to administer. As you can imagine, horses don't always enjoy it when we put something up their nose. Other vaccines that you should discuss with your veterinarian based on your horse's personal risk would include Potomac horse fever, botulism, anthrax, equine viral arteritis, and leptospirosis. It is important at this point to discuss the possibility of vaccine failure. There are several reasons for vaccine failure. Some are horse-based and some are handling-based. If the horse is incubating the disease at the time of vaccine, the vaccine will not be present for long enough to help that immune response and the horse will ultimately show signs of that disease. If the vaccine was handled improperly, from shipping from the warehouse to storage at the vet clinic or storage in the vet trucks, we are very careful to monitor the temperature of our vaccines and careful storage and handling so that this does not happen. Vaccines should be kept between two to seven degrees Celsius and we always have a thermometer on hand measuring what that temperature is. And then back to the horse, there is off sometimes a failure in immune response. If the horse is already sick or stressed, their immune system is not ready to respond to that vaccine and will not provide enough of an immune response. This is why we check your horse prior to vaccine administration by checking their temperature, feeling their lymph nodes, and ensuring that they're not sick at the time of vaccine. Steroid administration can also reduce the immune response and therefore reduce response to a vaccination. Another factor is low body condition or starvation. When horses are undergoing starvation, they do not have the resources available to stimulate an immune response and will result in vaccine failure. If you have any concerns about potential vaccine failure, do not hesitate to ask your veterinarian at the time of your vaccine appointment or call ahead. Thank you for taking the time to learn about vaccinations. Wishing everyone's, everyone and their horses a healthy and happy season.